we probably could have been successful in Vietnam if our primary mission was to gain the confidence of the South Vietnamese people, knowing their history. But we didn't, that wasn't part of the plan. The part of the plan was stop the spread of international communism. And that was really the only primary objective. As far as helping the South Vietnamese, we really didn't do that. You know, if you look at the, the, the life of an average South Vietnamese farmer, they, they, they'll, they spend their, their, most of their existence trying maybe, let's say they're a rice farmer. Yeah. They're standing behind a water buffalo with a single bottom plow up to their ankles in mud and their knees in water, following that buffalo around. Then they're out there with a basket. And I've watched them do this. And they have the, the little sprouts, the, the rice sprouts. And then they go down up to their elbow in water and or probably their wrist in mud. And they push that in there. And they spend months doing that, getting that field set up. And then what happens? And our, 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 say a search and destroy mission comes through. What is the first thing they do when they hit a rice paddy? They spread out so they're not a target, a big target. And they walk through this rice paddy, not thinking, you just destroyed this guy's income, his whole livelihood, his whole year's work. You destroyed it just by walking through it. And you haven't even caused the destruction, at least in your mind yet. And you alienated this guy. You know, it's the things like that. Where we should have, if we could have automated some of his stuff, maybe with a tractor or something like that, which is what they do now, you know, we probably could have won him over in, in most of the country. Do you think more effort should have gone into the hearts and minds work? 70, 80 percent of the effort should have been into that. And, and we did a lot of good things there, but it was much too little. For example, the military would go out and do medical things, but right. then they'd disappear. What they needed was something, you know, at least permanent that, the, you know, because you're out there, if you're in a little village and your child gets sick, you know, you might have somebody local who might think they know something about medicine, but maybe not access to drugs and access to what they need, you know, so your child could die where they could have been saved, you know. And the medical team that showed up a month ago, that was great, but yeah. it's not helping us now, okay. Yeah, they're actually very good. They're military guys, and they, they had all of the equipment they needed, most of the drugs they needed, but they were there, and then they were gone. Well, and then I do want to ask you one, one other thing in, related to what you, in relation to what you said a few minutes ago. You know, the struggle against communism, and communism was real, and South Vietnam did become communist, so communism was a real thing. But you, you speak the language, and you're interacting with these folks in South Vietnam. Did you have a sense... You know, clearly there are there are people in Vietnam, in the north, in the south, who are devoted ideological communists. But mm -hmm. did you have a feeling interacting with ordinary folks in the south, speaking with them in their language, that that they cared at all about communism or politics at all? If you tried to tell them that the reason we're here is to fight international communism, it would it would it was meaningless to them. It was meaningless to them. And if, if, you know, I don't know what we do with pamphlets and stuff like that, but if you tried to say, you know, that the Ho Chi Minh guy there, you know, he was dead by the time I got there, but the Ho Chi Minh guy, he wasn't a good guy because he was a communist. Well, that's like saying George Washington was a bad guy because he was a Tory or whatever. He was, I guess he had no political party, but uh, yeah. his political party. Right. You would say, well, gee, George Washington was a member of this party. It can't be that bad. Well, you can't tell the South Vietnamese that, that communism is bad if, if Ho Chi Minh believes in communism. So if you just as a thought exercise, you walk up to, you know, typical, you know, villager in South Vietnam and say, well, you got two options. You could have the workers utopia or you could have a free water buffalo. Which one? Which one do you prefer? Oh, free water buffalo. I'll go with the water, water buffalo. Water buffalo were valuable. They yeah. were valuable. And of course, there's another problem. During a firefight or something like that, or if you killed a water buffalo, especially a pig. If you killed a pig, you destroyed that, that, that a year's food for that family. You just did. You know, where we thought nothing of if an animal died, it was a big deal for them. You know, I hear other guys talk about Vietnam, and I understand their their perspective on it. But you know, from my perspective, it, it wasn't like they thought it was. You know, they would go into Vietnam, and they'd have no communication at all with the Vietnamese. Any Vietnamese they saw was suspect, right? And uh, you're always on your guard. You're always defensive, and that created a hostility. Before, even if there was no hostility, that created a hostility, that environment. Where my experience was totally different. You know, the, the day I went over to that army base, 
and they found out I could speak Vietnamese, it changed everything. It just changed everything, you know. I told you, I was like Elvis when I walked into that place. You know, you know the people would crowd around me and they'd be, they'd be touching me, you know, and they wouldn't want to talk to me. They will try to take, ask me questions. It was completely different. And you go to a, a rural village where you know they were hostile towards you and you started, started speaking Vietnamese, they would get curious and, and the hostility, it never went away. They, they didn't like Americans, there's no doubt about that. But, you know, it, 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 made, a, it made a difference. We were up in Cambodia, at the Cambodian border with the, with the Benoit. Now the Vietnamese were still going into Cambodia, but the Americans were staying out. And uh, there was a guy they hired, the Vietnamese hired to, to manage the boats. And I, you know, I went down and talked to him and asked him what his name was. He told me Charlie, right? His American name was Charlie. And I think it was a joke on his part because he was one of these guys, 40, 50 years old. And we got to be friends, you know, and he invited me to, to, to stay at his house a couple of times. And the guy had a strange house. It, was, it looked like it had been a, a pagoda or something because you walked in the door and there was two hallways that went around the side and there was this oval room in the middle. And in the middle, there was a, a Western bed, which is unusual because usually they slept on mats. And he said, this is where you're going to stay. You know? And uh, Charlie seemed to know a lot about what's going on over the border. We were right near the border in Cambodia because I would tell him, you know, well, I think we were going to probably going to patrol over this area. And he'd say, you know, you really don't want to go over there because it's pretty dangerous there. So I think he knew a lot what was going on. And uh, we, we, I was there one night and he said, okay, good night. You know, and he, I was in the room there and, 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 and there was, there was doors all the way around this room, just like it was an entryway for a, for a this place. You know? And I see Charlie and uh, I'm laying on my side and I see him walking down the hallway and he goes out the door. This is like about nine, 10 o'clock at night and he leaves. And, you know, I, I waited and I was awake for like an hour. He never came back. And then I fell asleep. And when I was back in the morning, he was, you know, Oh, how are you? Just like nothing happened. So he left during the night. So who knows what he was doing? I mean, uh, he was probably in, at least a minimum informing on the, 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 the activity of the American boat there, you know, and that's just the way it was in Vietnam. You know? Like I say, if, if you talk to 10 Vietnamese, six of them were supporting, at least supporting or reporting. At and the it, same time, though, he's being friendly to you. Oh, yeah. We were buzz, buzz, best buddies. You know, they're, they're, you know, he, he introduced me to his family and he would take me around. This is the Tan Chow was the village. He'd take me around Tan Chow and, you know, hey, you know, there's my buddy. Another time, uh, we were in... Uh, Chow Duck, I think, which is also near the Cambodian border. And we had stopped to refuel at this ATSB, this, this little base that was up there. And we, I walked down and, and, and the, I was looking for, the, for some place to get something to eat. They must have some chow or something, you know. So I'm, I'm walking around and I hear North Vietnamese accents talking in one of the hooches. And I go up there and I got my M16 with me. I flipped it on automatic. I figured some day to day and they were, they were invaded. I get closer to female voices. And it was the hooch maids. They're sitting there talking to each other and they're all speaking North Vietnamese, which is very distinct. It's like, it's like um, you know, somebody from where you're down in the South, somebody from the South talking to somebody from Liverpool, England. That's the difference. That, that's a big difference. It's hard to understand Vietnamese. But I can understand that the, 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 the sounds that were coming. And they were all North Vietnamese. And I said to the, the lieutenant was there and says, Where'd you get these people? So all the local people, we, we hired them for right here. And they're all North Vietnamese accents. Now, could have been legitimate, but you know, we're in the Delta. You know. So you never found out whether no. they had come down the trail and were no and were we informed. Were for day. I said, you know, I said, good luck, you know. Wow. And he said that the village was kind of hostile to them. They were they, they, they were the villagers more friendly. Wow. So I would imagine those, you know, the, the, those those three hooch maids were not native to that area because they, they didn't speak. They didn't have that accent. Who knows how they got there? Sure. Maybe they were legitimate. Maybe they were legitimate, you know, uh, who came down from the north, but they were young enough where they, I don't know, it, it didn't make sense. It just didn't add up. It's one of those things that didn't add up. And Americans, you know, were ambivalent to it. You tell me these people are speaking North Vietnamese, and oh, well, you know, what, what does that mean? You know, uh, it's an interesting thought exercise how things might have been different if if uh, 
most of the troops, at least the troops who are going to interact with Vietnamese, if they had had a couple weeks of of intensive Vietnamese going in and, and at least could communicate on a you're right, because the language barrier that's that's a huge separation, right? Yeah. If you can communicate even a little bit, then that breaks that down. It would have made a world of difference, world of difference. And I think by the time I got there in 1970, that the, the military higher ups, like in MACV, they understood what had to be done. I think they did. That's why they started getting advisors that could speak Vietnamese. And they started having these other programs to, to, to really help the people. But it was just like I say, we had been through the, the mid 60s where we were doing just search and destroy and strictly kind of military operations. And by then, the damage was done.